Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for having us here at uh, ETCC. It's always a pleasure to see the amazing uh, community that is um, in Europe and in particular in France and Paris. Um, I'm going to talk about next steps for StarkNet and in particular about uh, governance and also things like the StarkNet token and the StarkNet foundation. But for those who are, uh, who just happen to be here by chance and don't know quite what Stark, Starkware, and StarkNet are, I'm going to give just a very brief uh, few minutes uh, just introduction. So those who know this, I apologize. So a little bit, the abridged uh, Starkware and StarkNet story. Um, our technology is the culmination of 30 years of pretty advanced math and um, Starkware is very proud to be at the forefront of making all of this practical through a series of uh, inventions and creations that most of them were done within our company and, and a few uh, by co-founders and researchers and colleagues. So this includes uh, Stark, Fry, Validium as a data availability model, the Cairo virtual machine and programming language, the concept of layer threes and recursion. Uh, if you attended the views talk yesterday, then you probably heard about that. At the core, what all of this technology offers you is integrity, which means the ability to know that the right thing was done even when you were not watching. And we're talking about knowing that a computation done off chain was done correctly according to the specification of the program. And this is very important in the context of blockchains. Now, today, we are proud to be the entity that is pretty much scaling Ethereum as a standalone layer two by the greatest amount and extent in terms of TPS and volume transacted. The Starkex systems are hauling um, more than all the other L2s combined. And we're doing so under, with no change to the security assumptions of Ethereum, but you always need to read the fine print. And the fine print says, well, there's a single operator currently for the Stark X systems and also for the Stark Net systems. And that single operator, of course, means that in terms of liveness and censorship resistance, there's room to improve. And that's why we're talking today. So, those of you who are already signed up to StarkNet CC tomorrow, you'll hear a lot more about all of this deep dives into Cairo and Starks, and you'll see the ecosystem. And uh, now I want to tell you a little bit about, about what StarkNet is. So, oh, sorry, before that, four milestones over four years. First, we built by hand um, the system that was StarkX, the first version that allowed us to scale. Uh, but then, in order to make things more scalable in terms of the ability to uh, add features quickly, we developed Cairo, and you're, you'll hear a lot about Cairo tomorrow, those attending StarkNet CC. And uh, then we use that to improve on the StarkX system, building systems such as DYDX, and we're proudly serving also Sorer, Immutable, Diversify, and others. And uh, StarkNet is the latest thing that we've been doing. So what is StarkNet? It is a decentralized, permissionless, Stark-based validity rollup um, offering scalable and secure Ethereum-like state. So if you know Ethereum and you know what it gives, all the good that it gives, that's pretty much StarkNet, but at much greater scale under the same assumptions as Ethereum, just greater scale. It is a layer two. You can write smart contracts today. It's already live in alpha on mainnet for almost a year general computation, composability, all the good stuff. Now, it works very similar to Ethereum. Uh, transactions are submitted to a mempool, and then they are sequenced by a sequencer, and then there's a prover that generates a stark proof for the integrity of all this computation that was done off-chain. And all nodes of Ethereum verify the proofs, and the proofs are exponentially smaller than the amount of transactions covered by such a proof. Thereby, you get your scale, and the mathematics and cryptography of Starks assure you that the right thing was done, even when the Ethereum nodes were not watching. So this system, again, is live on mainnet today. Now, there are dozens of external teams that are building 
an amazing um, and thriving ecosystem um, with a lot of infrastructure and tools. And um, you know, this shoot up in the number of downloads came after our announcement of uh, the token and foundation. And uh, but even before that, there were thousands of nodes running and uh, thousands of developers working on this platform. So this was a brief introduction for those who don't know what StarkNet is, what Starkware is, and now I want to get to the meat of this talk, which is what are our next steps for StarkNet? How do the uh, foundation and token fit in? And what is the vision and essence and what inspired us when we came to think about and design uh, these structures? So the vision is that Starks as a technology should be public infrastructure, a public good, something that is non-exclusionary, -exclu exclu um, non-rivalrous, inclusive, like Ethereum, like the internet. And this core technology, this mathematical technology, is actually made such public infrastructure by StarkNet. So StarkNet, as a blockchain layer two, is the way we see the core technology being public infrastructure available to all for the good of, uh, you know, of all of us. Now, so far, if we look back at this last year or so, since StarkNet has been live in Alpha and Mainnet, the functionality is pretty good. Developers, there's always room to improve, but developers can write a lot of smart contracts that are meaningful to users. Uh, the throughput is being improved. It can be better. We have already publicly said that we hope that by the end of this year we'll do 10x the throughput of Ethereum at amortized cost of 1 over 100 uh, smaller than the fees of Ethereum and we're confident we're going to reach that, hopefully maybe even more. Um, and in terms of decentralization, well that is exactly what we're going to talk about today. The decentralization of the network so that it becomes, so that it is and maintained a public good. Now, decentralization is very hard. Things like, you know, decentralization, freedom, governance, there are many, many different ways to define and think about them. And I want to share with you what underpins our view of this. It has to do with developer inclusivity, which means we are trying, we're putting developers first, and we would like to, to solve the following problem. We would like that two years, five years, ten years down the line, if there are new developers that are coming in and do valuable work that improves the system via software, maybe someday hardware, we want them to be automatically uh, compensated via the token, the StarkNet token, and they should be compensated so that they have a say on the governance and they can influence where the system is going and also are offered to be part of the network that is servicing and operating it in terms of uh, nodes running the system. It is very important for us to solve this problem, and that's at the core of what we've designed. Now, we believe that if we solve this, devs are going to build a platform that is going to be very, very help helpful and useful as a public good for users, and users are really the true and ultimate citizens of this, uh, you know, of Web3 or of the, uh, this world that Ethereum and uh, we are trying to build. So, the, the Starcore was founded four years ago, more than four years ago, and it was founded at the height of the um, ICO season. For instance, Filecoin and Tezos both raised around a quarter billion dollars at the time. And we raised, uh, you know, compared to this, a meager six million. Now, everyone around us, you know, uh, investors and consultants and so on were saying, you, you should uh, announce an ICO and a token. And we said no. And we were asked since then, you know, when token? And uh, for four years, we said no, or rather the formal answer was no comment. Um, and now suddenly things changed. Now, in the interim, we raised over several rounds more than a quarter a billion dollars of equity. And what I want to say is that the answer to why token or when token has nothing to do with uh, raising funds or so on. That's not the reason. The reason is something very different. The reason 
that we're now saying yes is that um, it is needed for starting a decentralization, okay? And here's a story that we experienced in the past and is a bit of an inspiration for why we're putting developers first. So the very, one of the very first blog posts that we wrote when Starkware was founded um, said, okay, here's the business model we would like to use. We would like to build this uh, amazing infrastructure that is you know, making Starks available for more uh, integrity at scale. And this infrastructure is gonna be part of maybe several different blockchains. So we would like to do tech for token. We would like to do work developing software and research that is gonna improve uh, these other uh, networks. And we would like to be, uh, um, to get in return tokens um, and, and then, you know, this is the way we wanted our business model to work. And what we realized after talking to many, many uh, chains is that chains just don't work this way. Um, you know, mining rewards pretty much go all of them to, uh, or nearly all of them go to uh, um, miners, right, that are doing very important work, but they don't really go to developers. And it's just not done. And, you, and most of the foundations usually have a finite, maybe very large, um, finite amount of tokens that have to last for eternity, and it's very, it's very hard for them to, 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 to make uh, such uh, deals. Now, this is the inspiration. We're not doing now something that is tech for token, but it is the inspiration when we came to thinking about StarkNet for maybe we can try and have it so that others will have a different experience. And we would like developers to get StarkNet tokens for the valuable work that they are doing for StarkNet. And as a consequence of that, they will be in charge of the governance and also be part of the operators of the system through sequencing and proving. And um, this way, especially if we can do it somewhat automatically, will also help the, uh, increase the inclusivity, meaning that people, newcomers, can come and uh, be part of the ecosystem. Okay. Now let's talk a little bit about where StarkNet today is on the decentralization continuum. So there are certain aspects that are centralized, and we discussed this a little bit. The operator of StarkNet and a lot of the core software are written and uh, maintained and uh, operated only by Starkware. But there are other very important aspects that are decentralized today. Uh, the most important one is that the security layer is that of Ethereum as in layer one. And it's very decentralized and very secure. Um, also, a lot of the um, infrastructure, such as wallets, full nodes, APIs, is, is being written by external parties. And it's the, 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 this ecosystem is growing very rapidly. Um, by now, most of the hackathons, education, and onboarding of new developers is actually done outside of Starkware. Again, Starknet CC is one such example, and uh, we see this like big, beautiful wave that we are just becoming one drop in, and we're very happy of that. And of course, smart contracts and dApps are all built by, by external teams. So we're somewhere on this spectrum. So what do we need to do more? And why do we need to do more? We need StarkNet to, and we need to ensure that StarkNet never depends on any single one party, including Starkware, even though Starkware, um, you know, came up with some of the core ideas and technology. And um, what this means is, and why we need this, so you need to decentralize operators to maintain liveness, right? If Starkware tomorrow just shuts down, you still need the system to be, um, you know, the state to move forward and people to submit transactions. You also need to prevent censorship. Uh, what happens if Starkware decides or is, uh, you know, uh, needs to uh, censor certain transactions? This cannot happen. So we need decentralization of operation. We also need decentralization of the whole process of development. So there is transparency to the way upgrades are being done and where the system is moving towards. And we also need it to be inclusive and participatory so that you know, people can come on and improve it all the time. So this is what we need to uh, address. And now the question is, Okay, if Starkware is, as a single operator and as a, as a main developer of the core software is stepping, taking a step back, then who takes the reins and how do we control this? And the answer we're giving now, this is 
you know, the next answer, right, but there will be further steps down the line, is that we, we, we believe that a governance token and the assistance of a foundation are the next immediate steps on this uh, furthering the centralization path. So the mission of the foundation is to maintain StarkNet as a public good and to develop, test, and implement community decision-making processes. The token is used to define the community, to give governance rights to those who are advancing the ecosystem, and to um, and as a as a currency for fees and for minting, sorry, as a fees and minting are being done also for operating system, but also for work being performed um, by developers. Now the foundation is going to be allocated slightly more than half of all tokens minted thus far. And it's going to be funded by a one-time grant of these tokens from Starkware. It is right now being set up, and more details are going to be appearing as it's, uh, you know, as it's up and running. <clears throat> the token will be required for three things, for governance, voting on important things. It will be required for paying transaction fees in the native StarkNet token. And it will be required for staking if you want to be one of the operators of the system. We published a three-post series, and I encourage you all to read it. Um, and we explain there in great detail, you know, all the reasoning and how we're doing it. This is one of the um, pie charts that appears there. It gives the allocation, and there's more explanation there. Uh, there are 10 billion tokens that have been minted so far, and there will be ongoing further minting, right? So the circulating supply is not going to stay fixed at 10 billion. What I want to do here is just highlight a few things that are also mentioned there. Um, the first one is that roughly third, uh, just slightly less than 33%, are going to core contributors. And here, what we are doing is putting both Starker employees and consultants. Um, everyone who is in this uh, chunk gets the tokens under a four-year lockup with a one-year cliff and gradual release. Um, just to emphasize, these tokens under this portion are not being uh, vested. They are uh, unconditional on lock. Um, and the last thing I want to mention is that this part also covers the many, many developer partners that are strategically aligned with um, StarkNet and its mission. And I won't read the whole list because it's uh, long. There's actually a few more that we haven't announced yet. And I also want to take this opportunity. I also wrote in a tweet previously that there's an exciting announcement that I want to make. So the announcement is we have, um, we're very proud to partner with the uh, local Paris-based uh, Ledger uh, hardware wallet team. Uh, and we have a new strategic partnership with them between StarkNet and uh, Ledger. That's a We've been working with Ledger for a very long time, and uh, they're like you know, one of the best out there. So we're very, very happy that Ledger is also going to be supporting Star StarkNet transactions from the get-go at a very high level. So now we have these as well. Uh, we also have Ledger, and more are going to be announced. All of this comes from this chunk that is roughly one-third of the tokens allocated. Another point I want to highlight is that more than half, slightly more than half, are going to the f uh, foundation, and the foundation is going to be very independent from, from Starkware. Uh, but you'll see more details when they emerge. Inside this 50%, 18% are going to users under rebates and provisions. Um, so that's where users are going to be allocated funds. And the last thing I want to say, again, highlighting developers first, is that um, a very large chunk, nearly 50%, is going to various developers, both the ones who are core contributors and via grants are going to go to developers on an ongoing basis. These grants are going to be uh, made once the foundation is up and running. Now, the last thing I want to focus on is on um, initial thoughts on how the ongoing automatic flow of fees and minting will go to um, uh, developers. So developers are doing work to build and maintain StarkNet. They're going to get tokens so that they can influence the governance and operate it. 
And here you need to distinguish between two kinds of developers. There are those whose work can be measured by the StartNet system, uh, namely smart contracts. You can measure gas and how much pe uh, people are paying fees for using these smart contracts. And on the other side, you have the core devs that are harder to measure their contribution. People running, uh, writing the code for provers or for uh, wallets or full nodes, it's harder to measure through the, through the network their contribution. So when it comes to automatic um, compensation via tokens, it's a bit easier to solve it for the guys on the left. And what we want to do is that a fraction of the layer two fees that are being paid are going to go to the smart contracts for which they were paid to use. And also minting of new uh, issuance of, of tokens, a portion of that will go to cover the L1 Ethereum fees that are burned um, used by those smart contracts, right? And we'll make sure, so you have anti-gamification methods, we'll make sure that these fractions are always strictly less than one, so that, it, you know, uh, it's, uh, there's no incentive for a sequencer or a prover just to add stuff in order to get more minting or fees. Now, when it gets to core devs, you're gonna have to have some human discretion um, and that human discretion on how to allocate a portion of fees and minting that will go to them, this will be uh, defined at a later time. I want to close just by wrapping up and just reminding you of the vision. Our vision is that devs come first. They are going to be receiving tokens before, uh, you know, community rebates and provisions, right? You know. Some people may find that, you know, they think that users should come first. We made a strategic decision so the developers come first. Um, developers will receive a portion of fees and minting to compensate them for their work, to give them a say at the governance. Think of this developer who is now, you know, in, in college or in high school and five years down the line is going to do some amazing work. We want them to be automatically joining the table and influencing without needing to write, uh, you know, some proposal to some committee to, to give them power. Um, we want them to be part of those operating the network for the benefit of everyone. If we succeed in this, and there are many, many question marks here, then hopefully StarkNet will become a public good or more so and, you know, perpetually maintained and improved like Ethereum and StarkNet will scale Ethereum to meet global demand. And because it's Ethereum, you know, we have to put a rainbow somewhere. So here it is. Um, thank you very much. I think I have two minutes. Happy to answer questions. I can sing, sing something, meanwhile. <laughs> I, I think they want to record it. What do you see as the impediments to the growth of StarkNet? Like, when, when you wake up and say, what will keep it from growing as fast as you want, maybe beyond what StarkNet can provide? What are the limitations? Is it hardware, software, demand, et cetera? Certainly not demand. Um, today it's not hardware. Um, I would say that today it's within the software stack just having um, an even better developer experience and more tooling. And of course as you scale any infrastructure, think about internet bandwidth, at any given point in time there'll be some bottleneck and you know you, you remove that one and then there's another bottleneck. Right now, we are unrolling a, um, there are some things about the sequencer, which by the name it is, you know, somewhat sequential that we're trying to improve. So, I mean, that's one of the current bottlenecks, but once we remove that, this is just, you know, the next few months, uh, once we remove that, there'll probably be others. We're not yet at the stage where hardware um, is, is a limiting factor, not yet. Hi, Ali. Um, big fan over here. Ah, okay. Uh, big fan of Sarkware, but uh, also of you. Uh, I wanted to ask, so right now your technology is mainly, um, y your, your main goal was to scale Ethereum. Um, 
other ZK rollups, for example, focus on privacy. Uh, I was wondering if you had any plans for uh, privacy preserving uh, transactions uh, either on Starknet or uh, something like that. Yeah, that's a terrific question. So you already get, you're going to get some version of privacy by th doing things like layer three, or if you look today at the Stark X systems, especially those that are running in Validium and not in roll up mode, there's already pretty good privacy preservation for users from the blockchain. The operator of the system knows a lot about them. That's the way it's currently. But it's also a, a you know, a, so, somewhere on the continuum of privacy, it also gives you some, some answer. Now, it's very easy to make the Starks, ZK Starks, making a fully privacy-preserving system that is usable, is, you know, uh, big entities like exchanges and, um, and, 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 you know, custodians and so on can use it. Uh, from a regulatory point of view, from a user experience point of view, and many other things, it's a much, much, much bigger challenge. Um, you, you may know I, I was one of the founders of Zcash, and I mean, and you see there the, the, the hardness of, of you know, getting wallets to actually do shielded transactions and things like that. It's not a, an easy task. And the reality is that if you look at blockchains today, users, I mean, Users vote with their tokens to say that they don't care as much about privacy. It is a fact. Like, you know, like Monero, Zcash, Tornado Cash, they're not top 10 or top 20. So, so it's the reality. Once there's, we will have privacy. Once there's bigger demand, of course, this will become a higher priority. But the reality is that it's not the most burning thing for users. Until it is. Yes. I think my time is up. I, I don't know. But, uh. Okay. Thank you very much.